so is amazing tech is that going to come after my land acknowledgement because that's not a consistent reaction I have nothing on. I have nothing on. You hear the fan? You want me to take off the fan? One, two, three. Can you hear me? Am I? You can hear me well enough. Okay. Is there too much glare on my glasses? No. no. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm really looking at it. So we won't be able to see each other. Well, I could see I could see Rodney, I could see Diana, and I could see Dory, but I can't see me. Well, I can see me in the corner. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a little square. Yeah. Is it, is it available on YouTube, like 
sort of so if you see me sweating you know why
she from, say she come from brick Then I say you wanna want that road boy thing everyone. I would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we get is a traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the huron Wendat and the Kootenai. We acknowledge these nations and all of the indigenous peoples, including the Métis, who have called the land on which Toronto is built home. Caribbean tales strive to honor this land by sharing our spaces with all people, those indigenous to Turtle Island, those from all around the world. Additionally, I'd like to acknowledge that this land was settled and supported very early by people of African descent. The first named African native translator, Matt Cosby, by 1604, and of the ongoing and seminal contributions made to him and those that preceded and followed in development. We must acknowledge that African Canadians are an integral part of shaping Canadian history, and our history will not be the same with the people experience. So, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us wherever you are in the world, whether you're sitting on your couch, on your bed, we are appreciative of you. And the trailer that was played is a tape of what to come. I'd like to let you know that the Entails Media Group is a huge conglomerate, and under the Tales Media Group have three film festivals, two of which belong in Toronto and one in the UK. So we have Caribbean Tales International Festival right here in Toronto, as well as our Cinefest Festival here, and our winners in the UK. My name is Dan Lovely. I am the festival director for this year's Caribbean Tales International Festival. We are celebrating 15 years, one five. Please give us a round of applause, pat us on the back. It was not easy. And for that video, we have to thank our award-winning filmmaker, Francis Anthony. So let's get into why we are here today. We are launching our Caribbean Tales TV network, which you are on right now. And you can also be joining us on our YouTube channel. If you are, Welcome as well. If you want to log in to Caribbean Tales dash TV.com, you can join the discussion right after the panel happens. And then we'll get to our. Thank you, sponsors. And as well as our lead sponsors, Caribbean Tales Worldwide Distribution and Caribbean Tales TV. Thank all of our speakers and partners for support, as well as the Canada Council. Our panelists today, both members from the Caribbean Tales family, please welcome Dr. Keith Nurse, Dr. Dory Thompson. Dr. Keith Nurse is the principal and president of the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College and also the board chair of Caribbean Tales Worldwide Distribution. And Dr. Dory Thompson is the dean of the Faculty of Design at the Ontario College of Art and Design University, otherwise known as OCAD, right here in Toronto, Canada. She's an academic leader in decolonization and indigenization of design curriculum and practice. Dr. Tonsil is also the first Black Dean of Design faculty anywhere. And she's also joined our board in 2019. So please, let's welcome them to our panel. How are you going? Very good. 
I'm waiting for my barbecue and strawberry soda for Juneteenth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, an appropriate day for us to launch Caribbean Tales TV. Now, we are talking about Black Lives Matter and in relation to this film, 70, Remembering a Revolution, what was going on in the Port of Spain in those streets with young men and women, you know, saying power to the people on the streets and that revolutionary movement. The comparison and the cultural climate today, we just want your perspectives on that, being that Dr. Keith Morris is based in the Caribbean and the majority you're a Canadian and American experience. Mm -hmm. Dean Dory, would you like to pick that first? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I think what we're experiencing right now is um, the, the great call for accountability in all of our institutions to, um, to serve uh, Black lives with the same um, with the same respect um, that they serve other other populations, um, particularly as they serve um, white white bodies or white white people, um, and I think the call for this is we've had this call before in terms of just the basic uh, respect for human rights of Black lives and Black lived experience. Um, but I think what makes this time distinct is is two particular things. I think. Um, one, we have more uh, Black leaders in position uh, to be able to, in many ways, answer the call of the streets and bring them into institutions and, and bring about significant change. Um, and I think the second thing um, that I think is really important about the moment right now of what's happening is that um, because very few people can do um, other things, everyone is listening. Like, Everyone is listening. They can't go back to work the next day and ignore what's going on. And so um, things that people um, who are not directly experiencing injustice in the same sort of way are seeing injustice um, in a way that um, opens up new possibilities for adjusting um, or changing um, the structures that have caused um, injustice and the failure of institutions for Black communities. Yeah, uh, Dory did a real good introduction, so I'm going to just piggyback on, piggyback on that. Uh, today's Labor Day in Trinidad, it's a public holiday, and really Labor Day in Trinidad and Tobago is celebrated on a different day from the rest of the world, and that's because it, it memorializes the, uh, the labor riots in the 1937 here in Trinidad and Tobago, which uh, then spread to the rest of the Caribbean, Barbados, Guyana, Jamaica, and so on. Um, ultimately, and you know, resulting in the, the British setting up the Moyne Commission to evaluate the conditions under which the black population um, was was living in that time, and that time was a global economic depression in the 1930s, not too dissimilar to what we are now experiencing. So there was a, a massive reversal in the standard of living um, for the black population, in particular, throughout the Caribbean. And uh, this resulted in excessive uh, riots, protests, and so on, which ultimately resulted in adult suffrage being granted to the black population. So arising from the social movements, you see social change. And so the question that arises today is what social change should we expect or demand arising from the current circumstances? So the, the pandemic conditions and the global economic conditions, which we've been experiencing since 2008, 2009, with the global economic downturn, have really been the key uh, drivers of some of these processes. Because the racial prejudices have been there ever since. They haven't changed much. Um, what has changed is the conditions around which this is operating. So the level of inequality has risen the level of, um, of, of violence in many respects has also risen. And what's also important, and I'll just end on this note, is that uh, now everything is live on video, mm -hmm. on Facebook, YouTube, you name it. And so it's the technology that's also interfacing with this process, which is really making it global. 
And I think it's particular the 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 democratization of of technology where now before even 20 years ago to have a camera you would have to carry really heavy equipment now i can carry a camera in my phone right and be able to share it immediately with the rest of the world so i think the point that you're making um around technology helping to um to make scene um the social injustices um that are experienced by by black um folks black communities is really important to being able to change it, that visibility into injustice. I'd like to find out from both of you, what was the temperature like as a child? Sorry, can you repeat that? I'd like to find out from both of you, what was the temperature like growing up in the 70s or while any type of revolution was going on? What was around you? Hmm. Uh, okay. Growing up in the '70s for me was um, amazing because we were coming out of the civil rights movement in the '60s into Black Power. So I grew up with the messages of Black is beautiful. Um, I was one of the first generations where uh, Black History Month was taught in the schools, and my parents and aunts advocated very strongly for that. Um, I grew up in a context in which um, we were very um, optimistic about possibilities of, of change. Um, so I, I, I grew up with a sense of being part of the struggle, but also having hope that that struggle could actually bring about significant changes. Um, so I think in the 70s, it was a really ex really important time to be born in terms of having the lessons of the other gener of the older generations who in many ways experienced a kind of um, uh, oppression that is a little bit lighter for my generation but coming with that sense of resilience and coming with that sense of optimism and possibility being able to pass that forward to the next generation um, so that they're ready for whatever fights that they may be having, um, but at the same time, able to carry forward a more positive understanding of, of what it means to be Black and, and a notion of Blackness um, being a positive thing. Whereas I think with like my previous generations, there was a lot of anti-Black anti -black sentiment within their selves and their identities in ways that is not the same, I think, for my generation. It's a little bit weaker um, for the, um, the next generation. Um, but I think generation following after this, are a little more optimistic about being able to carry through that sense of Black pride into the militancy by which they act for their rights. Okay, what about you, Keith? Oh, well. Growing up in the 1970s, well, I was a young child when the Black Power movement and the revolts took place in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, it was hot um, in all kinds of ways, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, you saw a lot of violence uh, on the streets. Uh, even as a child, we saw the, you know, planes, you know, government planes um, dropping incendiary bombs into the hills. To, um, to deal with some of the revolt issues and so forth, um, going after the guerrillas. Um, there were lots of armed soldiers in the streets. And so it was a, a hot time. Um, but as I progressed into secondary school, uh, the issues didn't go away uh, during the 70s. Um, the, what we found was that uh, even you know, kids bringing what was considered seditious literature into the school was a problem where you could be expelled. In fact, one of one of my the older guys at my college was expelled, and we, you know we were we revolted about that or protested about that. Uh, so it was a hot time. So Trinidad is an interesting case study, though, because the the black 
power movement really spread in a significant way from the Trinidad experience throughout the rest region, similarly to what had happened in 1930s and 1937 in particular. And so Trinidad has been this interesting catalyst for some of these processes throughout the region. Uh, Trinidad has a long history of, um, of activism. So for example, you know, and spreading it too. So the first black lawyer in South Africa was Trinidad and Henry Sylvester Williams. He coined the phrase Pan-Africanism, organized the first Pan-Africanist conference back in the late 19th century. So we've been involved in these processes for a long time. And so you even see people like C.L.R. James, the, the Marxist, making the contribution to the literature to argue that um, from a Marxist perspective, it's not good enough to talk about class. You have to talk about race. And so making that significant contribution. And this goes on. Um, the contribution that Trinidadians and particular Caribbean scholars made to the independence movement in Africa, um, which uh, Francis Zahn's movie, Hero, chronicles. Mm -hmm. So the 17th was pivotal in that it helped to reframe a lot of institutions. So institutions that restricted access to people of color um, were forced to open up, um, whether it was the bank or country club or any of the other institutions that were considered exclusive, exclusively white back then, um, those things had to fall away. And so, yeah, to some extent, the, the changes are with us today. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done because now the issues have now evolved into black entrepreneurship issues. Um, still black identity issues, black empowerment issues. And so, so those are the things that still, um, there's still a lot of work to be done and some untold stories as well. Thank you for that. I just want to know from both of you, what positives can you see with what is happening today? Because there's a lot of negatives. Are we going to get to this? And will this ever end? Dean Dory? Well, I mean, we're having conversations about defunding the police, and it's a serious conversation where you have, um, you know, municipal governments putting in legislation to make those kind of changes. Um, you know, yesterday I can know, you know, it's like um, Mrs. Butterworth, Aunt <laughs> Jemima, Uncle Ben, all of these symbols of deep racism that was accepted um, on every layer of pancake mix and uh, rice are now disappearing because it's no longer socially acceptable to have racism as your brand in that way. Um, so these are things that are the level of policy and the level of sort of everyday life that is shifting very quickly because of the social movement that we're now and the demands for accountability amongst business for not just throwing money and for incremental change, but fundamental structural change, like the work we're doing at OCAD and the Black Cluster Hire, bringing in five new Black faculty, where you had zero for 144 years, that's structural change. And the changes we had to make in the institution to make that possible, rewriting our notions of excellence, rewriting the way we call for candidates to apply. Those are the kind of structural changes that are happening that opens up so many possibilities for institutions being redesigned or rewritten in ways that are more decolonizing, inclusive, and by process diverse. What's your take on that? Uh, we go further. And, um, and really hit at the, 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 the levels of cultural violence that are embedded in the institutions and outside of the institutions, both within the, the, the wider community as well as within the black communities. Uh, so we are, we are not um, you know, uh, innocent in all of this. There is a way in which uh, uh, blackness has become both a stigma uh, within our own communities. So throughout the Americas, uh, issues of race are not just black and white. Um, 
the shadism, etc. So we have we have to we have to deal with those as well as decolonize the institutions of thought. So, for example, if you do a degree in economics, almost anywhere in the world, the way in which you are taught about um, the industrial revolution doesn't tell you that the industrialized India to make that transformation happen. Mm -hmm. or, or they wouldn't say, explain to you how it is that, um, you know, the British were able to export textiles with cotton in it when cotton comes from, you know, African slaves production in the United States and in the Caribbean. So the way in which we need to decolonize all of these institutions of thought, all the knowledge structures. So just tearing down Cecil Rhodes um, from in front of a university yeah. is not enough. Huh? So let us not get up with the surface. Because historically, there are protests and riots and social movements is that the dominant class co-ops the message Mm -hmm. And the eighth framework, which whereby there's a little bit of transition, but no significant transformation. So there's a lot of work to be done, particularly in terms of defining and redefining the stories. And that's why having uh, Caribbean films generating and facilitating the distribution content, content scripted from our narratives, is important. You can't important. This is because unless you are involved in creating stories, creating mythologies that our children live with in their heads, all of the other segments, you could change the institution, you could change the statues, you could change the label, uh, but unless you change the way we think about the world and the history of the world, then we still have a lot of work to be done. So that's where. My work is involved. That's where I think we need to be um, advancing even further. Thank you for that. So one final question before we get to a few questions that we have from our audience is what do you leave? What message do you leave for the next generation? Dory. Uh, um, resistance is everything. <laughs> resistance is everything. Um, that this generation has so many advantages in terms of being able to really um, hold power accountable both in terms of um, having access to previous generations who've who have done all the work and figured out all the strategies around how you how you move institutions right we have the generation from the 60s um the generation of sex they're still alive to be able to advise us. Um, have again, as we talked about before, you have technologies that allow for the fast and self-reporting of what's going on in the world that allows the filters that literally whitewash our news and whitewash our understandings of reality removed. Um, and then you have really powerful. Um, alliances that are being built between and across communities who have been structurally divided, but they're realizing the, the importance of making Black lives matter connects to being able to, for their lives to matter as well, whether they are, you know, indigenous lives mattering, whether it's um, uh, Asian lives mattering, whether it's uh, queer lives mattering, that everyone is seeing in the symbolism of the devaluing of Black lives, the valuing of their own lives by the system and the structure. And so they're coalescing around our struggle as a way to be allies, but also understand how our fate as a people is connected to their fates peoples as well. Can you keep your message to the next generation? Well, yes. Uh, I always say that uh, you have to be mad at certain points or you have to be strategic. 
where does the strategy come into play? And the strategy comes into play in, in some significant ways in terms of reframing the way we operate. So we're at the cusp of a really important transformation in the global context, uh, climate change, and we see with emerging diseases like COVID, um, that we are into a, a next normal or a new normal, if you want to describe it as such. And what it means then is that there's going to be significant transformation such that the same communities that have been uh, marginalized are going to be even further marginalized. When you look at what's happening with the di digital economy, the widening gulf between countries is going to be exacerbated. The widening gulf between groups and communities is going to be exacerbated. So what are we going to do about that? Reparations by itself is an important um, but we need to talk about how we're going to reparate um, the individuals and the communities. Like how are we going to take control of that transformation process? How are we going to reduce chronic non-communicable diseases profile mm. of the black communities everywhere. Um, we need to change our diet. Um, yeah? We need to, to do a number of things to restructure the way we work, the way we live, et cetera, to make the transformation. Those are the things that we need to seize control over uh, as black communities. Uh, we can't wait on anybody else to, to make that transformation. So let's seize control move the, the, the needle forward and build institutional capacity that redounds to the benefit of our young people and generations of uh, in the future. Okay, going right into our audience questions, Keith. Uh, here's a question from Tanisha Campbell. Why don't we see more Black Caribbean people owning businesses in the Caribbean, especially when our leaders are Black? Oh, wow, that's a tough one, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Yes, we have black ministers, um, but who own the power structures, the economic structures in these societies? Uh, right, so, and that's a part of a historical formation. And so what we have is a scenario whereby uh, in certain key sectors, uh, it's been very difficult to get into those sectors if you don't have access capital. And so the black communities and the Afro, Afro descendant communities uh, have been marginalized for a long time. So whereas other communities got land when they got here, the Asian communities through indentureship got some land. Um, the French Creoles, when they were invited to come into the, to the um, to Trinidad and Tobago, for example, because it was under population, for every slave they got a certain amount, every slave that they brought with them, they got a certain amount of land. Mm -hmm. And so there's been a process of um, giving assets, critical assets to some groups and not to others. And so that platform makes a real difference even today. So our governments though haven't been strategic enough to build black entrepreneurship. Um, we have tended to focus on handouts. Um, and particularly around election time, uh, mm -hmm. this gets accelerated. But mm -hmm. as soon as elections are done, it's back to the normal. Um, and so, uh, particularly in, in areas or, or economic sectors where the black population dominates. So for example, the creative sector is largely unfunded throughout the Caribbean. And, it, and we, I've been advocating for this for now more than 20 years now. And I can tell you that the level of investment has been relatively uh, limited. Um, to the sector um, over time, relative to what's happening in the rest of the world. So the region is falling behind the parts of the world. So I, this morning I had some discussions with people from Africa about what they're doing. Um, the Afro Exim Bank, they're putting several hundred million dollars into financing the, um, the creative sector there. And uh, in the Caribbean, we haven't even come close to anything like that. So, um, yeah, so that's part of the challenge. All right, next question is from Mandisa Panton asking, uh, as younger people, what is our responsibility? 
Well, for young people, they have to get prepared, meaning they got to do their homework, they got to do the training, they do need to get the upgrading. Um, you can't wait for the institutions to do this for you anymore. You will have to seize control of it. Uh, in current context, a lot of content is available online, um, so you can uh, get this knowledge at your own um, behest. You do need to also get some level of certification. So important. It's also, I think, cultural awareness is becoming ever more important. Um, if our kids are doing everything all along and uh, imbibing other people's content, uh, then we have a problem. So you, you need to be also loading. You can't just be a downloader. So we need to create the frameworks for our young people to become uploaders, generating content, whether it's academic content, game content, other creative content. And I think they are very hungry for it. So uh, those of us who are running in students are to um, create the framework that allow them to, you know, surge ahead. So it's not just their responsibility, it's our responsibility as well as, as a bigger community. So um, yeah, prepared and being strategic are the key watch for young people. Mm -hmm. Jindori, I'm gonna get to the first, and it's pretty loaded. It's from Ashley Wood. Why are we as Caribbean so dependent on foreign investors? Why do we roll out the red carpet for European and Chinese people? Why are we selling out our people? Because since 1492, the system was structured that <laughs> way. Um, I mean, I think, um, uh, again, going even back further, I mean, you know, you talk about like um, the, um, Industrial Revolution, based on de-skilling and de-industrializing India, you go back, all of the wealth of Europe was stolen from the Americas. They left to go get gold, and they found gold, and they found indigenous peoples, and then they brought that back with them, built their coffers up in terms of their financing through theft and uh, slavery and depopulation, right? So in that sense, the banking system, the center of the banking system is still like Switzerland. Uh, and if you okay, well, maybe it was Hong Kong, it was, Hong, it was British Hong Kong that it was. So in terms of, again, these financial systems, they still own the means of, of generating and transferring wealth. Now, again, there's all these subsidiaries that are in the Caribbean, right? So there's whole thing about like, go set up your offshore account in the Caribbean. And, but again, that's money just passing through. That's not necessarily money going to the development of those places. It's not money that's going to um, setting up structures of entrepreneurship necessarily in those places. So why are we still, we, it's still, we are still in an economic structure in which there is dependency on Europe for financing. Um, we're still in a structure where, um, where you know, our business contracts are still written in the English language, um, or maybe French language, a lot of it now is the English language. Um, we're still in a structure where the resources of, of a country that's not in Europe is still being um, developed and exploited by Europe. And if it's not, then right now, again, China is, is jumping into the same game, but it's not, they're not investing in the same sort of way. They're investing in ways to structure defaults on loans, which then allows them to own the ownership of ports and places where they, again, they're colonizing again. Um, so it's by design, right? It's by design. It's by design of the economic system that re that requires still that dependency. And until we decide, for example, that um, you know, fashion and things from Europe 
is inferior to that which we may get from our local neighbors um, until we make decisions of like technology that may be designed in California and manufactured in China um, is important than technologies that we may get from design in uh, Ethiopia and built up in Honduras directly to another place. So we make those decisions around our supply chains, what we value and where it comes from, then it's really hard to shift those systems. It's really hard to shift those systems because every purchasing decision we make, every design decision that we make is validating in many ways a European system. Until we break that mentality, until we establish alternative routes of sharing um, and redistributing wealth, then then we're still we're still going to be dependent on that system. I mean, we still have to establish black banks, right? And we we have that every social movement right now. There's another call to establish black banks, and guess what? We establish it, but we don't sustain it. And then in our next social, um, social unrest, we call again. And why? Because they don't have ATM machines available in all the neighborhoods that's convenient for me to want to be able to sort of use my ATM to get money without having charged a fee. Now, who set up the system to charge the fee? Again, it's the other banks that do that, which then pushed me to not bank at a black bank if they don't have access to all the infrastructure of all the places where I want to get money from my ATM. Thank you, Dory. Keith, do you want to add anything? Well, yes, um, I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, this is a long-winded question. It's a very <laughs> tough one. Uh, what is emerging is this. Uh, unless, and I need to make a distinction here. Um, in countries like our own, we were colonies of exploitation, whereas North America, um, uh, you know, Canada, United States, colonies of, exp uh, of settlement. So mm -hmm. Colonies of settlement, a uh, dominant group, which is the indigenous population and decimated the indigenous population uh, of European descent. And so numbers matter in a significant way. And so throughout the because what we have is a mixture of different um, hybridities and so forth. And so cultural societies are so even more complex when you start talking about economic development and economic development. Such high levels of um, not just inequalities, but also structures between different groups. Generating solidarity, um, creating a, a perspective on something is very difficult. And that's a problem across the Americas. The Americas have this rate of this rate quality of all societies uh, on the planet. So we need to own that <laughs> process. So how do we address it? We begin to address these issues by building some capacities that have indigenous or local value added dimensions. So, for example, the Caribbean has a galloping food import bill. These companies were that were set up for agricultural production and exportation. And yet, we have um, most Caribbean countries in the top list of the most import dependent economies. Now, some of them are really small, and so you can understand the challenge of generating a lot of food. But even where we have some capacity, we're under investing on, in it. And we in building the entrepreneurial capabilities to facilitate the growth of our own food. And this is becoming even more critical with the chronic communicable disease profile mm -hmm. and how it's now linked to things like COVID. Uh, right? COVID has been very discriminating in its, in its impact. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just socioeconomic issues, it's also related to other underlying conditions and, and, and so forth of our population. So there's a way in which we now need to build this institutional capacity to address not health, but health nutrition. Mm -hmm. uh, and then generating that nutritional capacity generates now new sources of employment. 
and so on. So we need to treat it in a holistic way and, uh, and build that systematic capacity across um, the Americas, particularly in the, the normal colonies of exploitation, um, which is a different scenario. So uh, there, there, there's some distinctions that we need to make for strategy there for the populations. Um, but yeah, we need that kind of um, focused approach. So I feel our discussion could have a part two. <laughs> Out of time. Hi. <laughs> I, I love you both, but uh, we would need to also big up the directors that are here with us. Elizabeth is in the chat with us, joining us. So she's been listening to our conversation. Thank you so much for this documentary. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to thank our guests, Dr. Keith Nurse and Dr. D. Dory Tonsil for joining us and having a lively discussion. I'm so sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions, but I think we need a part two to close this out. But thank you so much for joining us. We are going to do the film right now. Please stay tuned, everyone. We appreciate your time, your energy, the fact that you're here with us launching Caribbean Tales TV, like hello, this is our for our peaceful and again without vision from our CEO founder, award winning filmmaker, and a member. So, seven remembering revolution by Alex and Elizabeth Cox, who's here tonight with us. Thank you so much for joining. Now, this is how a handful of students change the course of history in Trinidad and Tobago. Between February and April in 1970, the streets of Port of Spain were filled with three young black men and women chanting to the people with fists raised in a salute learned from the Black Panthers movement in America. Thank you all for joining us. Please stay tuned. The film is about to start. If you haven't subscribed to Christmas TV yet, can still do well and do it. song that you hear is an angry one and I am sure if you are seeing things clear you will see that all happiness is gone and then the dogs the dogs are barking too long it's a sign a sign that something is wrong so hark hark the dogs do bark the beggars are coming to town beggars in rags